Hello and welcome back to the third video in this Hacking SSO series. In the last video we took a quick look at a SAML login page and briefly talked about some XML attacks. In today's video we're going to take a look at some SAML traffic and dissect what is happening so we can understand from a hacker's perspective what can go wrong. There are various attack methods with SAML which a tester should be familiar with and we will cover these in this video series. As we take a look at some SAML traffic, vulnerabilities and potential attack vectors will stand out and become clear. So let's take a look at our burp output. In the last video, we logged into the service provider with our username of test3. You will notice by default there are a few items highlighted in yellow in the output via the SAML installed plugins. These are the items of interest which are sending SAML based traffic to our identity provider and our service provider. The host starting with 8FC shown here is our service provider. The host starting with 27 is our identity provider. The first thing to notice is that we're using the SAML 2.0 protocol request with this identity provider. The issuer of this request is the service provider at 8FC, which makes sense as this is redirecting for authentication. The last thing in this request is the authentication context which, as we already know, is password-based authentication. The next highlighted item is actually the same as our last one. However, this is using a GET request, which received a 200 status. The previous one was a OPTIONS, which received a 404. We will ignore the SAML request part as we just went over it, but let's take a look at the response. In the response value, if we scroll down, you'll see a SAML response which is a base64 payload starting with PHNH. This is in the form of a post request. If we take a look at the next request, here's our SAML values, but if we look at the raw data, we'll actually see a SAML response here with the same value PHNH. So our identity provider sent back that value and now we can post that and gain access to the application. So let's take a look at the actual SAML and see what it has in it. If we scroll up here, we'll see that we're still using the SAML 2.0 protocol. However, this time our issuer is actually our identity provider, starting with 27, sending back our SAML assertion to our service provider so we can gain access to our application. The next line denotes our authentication request with the identity provider was a success. This is important as we now have a successful example request to understand how to attack the target application, either by replaying this request or by modifying a request in transit. Below this, we have the assertion part of the SAML request containing the issuer, which of course is the identity provider, which issued this assertion. We also have information on our signature and our certificates. We're using a SHA-256 algorithm and if we cruise down a bit, we'll see something a little more interesting, which is the name ID, which matches the username that we created earlier. If this name ID field is not handled properly by the application, it can be used in authentication attacks against the server. For example, gaining access to administrative functionality, bypassing authentication controls, and becoming a more privileged user. A couple things to note here is stuff like not before, and not after. So in this case, this particular request shouldn't be used before 2116 or after 2216. I generally see about a five minute time window in most live applications, though this probably should be shorter. Another thing to note is that this is audienced for this service provider, the 18FC that we saw before and is not to be used for other audiences. These time windows should be both short and validated to limit the exposure to the application via an attacker using some sort of man-in-the-middle attack. Oftentimes a service provider does not validate these time windows, so you as a tester should test to see if the same request can be used later on outside the designated time window seen in the request. The audience is sometimes not validated as well and should be tested for an improperly audience SAML request. Meaning that this particular request should not work on a different service provider. 
And not all service providers will actually validate this. They may just look for something that says success, completely ignoring that the audience is not even valid for the target application. Another useful piece of information is that the name ID above, test3 at test.com, may not always be in that format. It will sometimes be in username format, it may be test3, or it may be transposed into some kind of user number, such as 1234, which associates with test3 at test.com, in which case, instead of just changing test3 at test.com to admin at admin.com, you may have to play with the numbers or play with the usernames and see which creates a valid user. If you haven't already, you should fire up your burp proxy and play around with this lab. See if you can get administrative access by capturing the traffic and modifying some values. That pretty much covers everything I wanted to show in this video. I hope the walkthrough of a SAML request was helpful. In this video, I really just wanted to show how simple these requests are and demystify them from a hacker's perspective and the key points you should validate throughout your testing. SAML is just XML and is pretty easy to understand if you take it line by line. Without wanting to ruin the lab for you by doing it live, you now have more than enough information to play with it yourself and then gain administrative access. In the next video, we'll cover more complicated attacks like XSW signature wrapping to bypass signature validation. If you learned something, hit the like button below. If you'd like to know when more videos are released, hit the subscribe button below.